Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious today with a very special guest and friend of our museum, Mr. Chris Stott. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me and uh, hello everybody. Thank you. Well, hello there. Yes, uh, we're, you're going to learn about something that I'll bet most of you don't know anything about, and that is saving Earth's data one bite of a time at a time. And that's what Chris Stott's business is all about. And we're going to get into that, talk a little bit about his eh, sort of famous wife. And uh, uh, but uh, Chris, it strikes me that uh, this is you are a um, you're an, a you're a moon child. Born in July 1969, and you have your sights set on the moon. Absolutely, yeah. Chris, where'd you grow up, and how'd you get into this? Uh, you, uh, tell us just a little bit your thumbnail background there. No, thank background. you. Um, actually, you know, outside of my mother and my father, a doctor and a nurse, the first vo human voices I ever heard was Walter Cronkite, Arthur C. Clarke, and Robin Heinlein commenting on the moon landings. Yeah, I was born early July. Yeah. And uh, for whatever reason, they needed to keep me at the hospital for a while. So they wheeled a color TV into my mom's room. Is that right? And so that's that's how they watched the moon landing for Apollo, Apollo 11. And, and that's those the literally those first voices that I heard. How does that strike you is what you know, you're involved in, you know, half a century later? Oh, I love it. Well, there's never been a time in my life that I haven't loved space. I think my mom even has pictures of me down in pre elementary school, grabbing astronaut helmets and putting them on and looking mm -hmm. at the stars and bugging them to take me places for space stuff and tech stuff. And I literally can't remember a time in my, my life that I didn't have an absolute maniacal focus and love on space and hmm. science fiction and more. Well, that's a lot like uh, us other space geeks going to move that microphone just a little bit closer there. As you're going to learn a lot about uh, uh, this, this man's career uh, is involving uh, this led to what I think is maybe a seminal moment for mankind is if uh, we have data breached on earth by a solar flare or, or good god forbid uh, nuclear holocaust um, how is the declaration of independence going to survive absolutely and that's what you're all about today isn't it chris it is. yeah so that's that's what our company lone star is doing lone star data holdings uh -huh. so if you think of it this way we look at the two most important things in our world today is us people right that's number one and number two is the data that we create because that data is the foundation, the bedrock of our entire technological civilization. And we lose that data, we lose civilization. The lights literally don't come on. Mm -hmm. you know, the money doesn't come out of the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the ship doesn't sail across the ocean. I mean, you lose everything. And it seems, well, gosh, surely people are looking after that, and they are. But the trouble is, there are so many threats to that data, from nation state hacking to network intrusions where they, they put malware into cable fibers to cyber weapons getting loose it happened in 2017 the not pettier uh, cyber weapon the russians let loose mm -hmm. spread worldwide did untold damage and then you've got regular ransomware throwing climate change hurricanes firestorms freezes and our most fragile yet agile asset as a species is data hmm. and so that's what we're looking to protect and we looked at that and we said okay You've got all this data being made on the Earth. That's where it's fragile. Let's, it's agile. Let's take it somewhere where it's safer. And we look at the moon as the perfect place to store the data for the entire human race. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's far enough away for encryption. It is line of sight to the planet. It is free cooling, free energy. It's stable. And it is Earth's largest satellite. It's so good for storing data. If it wasn't there, we'd have to build it. Hmm. Yeah, create the data here, store it up there. Literally leveraging the final frontier to protect our digital frontier. That is some cloud. It this is so it's a lunar speak. cloud. Yeah, this Absolutely. is another a lunar trademark. cloud. Yeah. <laughs> it's right in there. Yes. Uh, and, and as you're talking about storing the data, what goes through my mind, Chris, we're going to talk with Chris Stott here, and we're going to get a little more of his background uh, and uh, uh, why he's in town here. Is, uh, but it strikes me as... Um, the libraries of Alexandria. Yeah. Some of the most, uh, uh, what, what, the lost art, the lost archives, the mm -hmm. lost everything there. I've always been fascinated with as a, as a, a, a kid and then an adult. What was in there that, mm -hmm. that we that took us longer to, to under, understand? Yeah, and I, this is yeah. sort of what you're doing, correct? Is making sure Absolutely. we don't have a, 
a, uh, a, a zero BC Alexandria burned to the ground with the great libraries and all the scrolls left. Is this the... it. It's something that haunts my dreams. Literally. Really? Literally. And ever since a child, too. Because I've always loved space and we've always gone to Disney growing up. I'm very fortunate my parents took us over. Is this like a vision to you to do this as Absolutely. a child? 100%. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the Library of Alexandria, and that happened during the Roman Civil War. It wasn't someone accidentally knocking a candle over to a bunch of pirates. <laughs> right, right. I mean, this fire. Right, this was Julius Caesar's troops. This was a, an ancient version of a cyber attack. Uh huh. And it burnt down that incredible store of knowledge, a store of knowledge that was so incredible that two thousand years later we still talk about it. We're still worried about it. What did we lose? Yeah. And if it hadn't have been for backup copies of certain documents actually spread around the Middle East, we never ever would have had most of our modern civilization today. Hmm. And that's how important data is. I mean, it lit, from the software that runs our machines to the data that we create, every day the human race creates 2.5 quintillion bytes of new information. That's uh, that and what's a quintillion, yeah. Chris. I had to look that up too. 2.5 quintillion. quintillion. Quintillion bytes. It's a thousand petabytes a day, uh -huh. or an exabyte a day. Uh -huh. So we tend to think in terms of what gigabytes on phones. Uh -huh. Uh, then modern iPhones now carry you know, the other high-end models up to a terabyte of data. A petabyte is a thousand terabytes. Okay. And so that's a thousand petabytes a day, more than yesterday, created every day. And it's doubling every two years. Hmm. It's And throw in AI or machine learning, throw in everything else. And it's a, an incredible tool for civilization. But if we lose that tool, that's when the problems start. Hmm. Well, I love Chris's vision here. We're talking to Chris Stott about saving Earth's data up there. This is off the website we're going to talk about here in a minute. Uh, and uh, we've uh, uh, let's uh, you're here I'm because looking, I like it like a weatherman. How do they do that? Yeah, right. I I'm know like, it. I know. Way, Marty's always yeah, laughing. There we go. At. Well, there right there is one lovely lady who mm -hmm. you're married to. My and, best friend. And, uh, you're, yeah. and, uh, and what an earthling she is. Uh, mm -hmm. She's in town with the Scholarship Foundation, Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. That, yeah. Uh, we support wholeheartedly. They founded by the Mercury astronauts. Thank you for that. Very much. And uh, there's uh, we they're the oldest organization that's supporting scholarships mm -hmm. for kids directly through the astronauts. There was a young man at the breakfast I attended today that uh, your wife Nikki's involved there. That was beautiful, and she graciously asked uh, request uh, honored us with a book signing today, and that gave me an opportunity to talk to you about. Uh, your uh, your business here and how you got there so uh and thank we'll, you. we'll talk yeah. a little bit about uh, nicole at the end here sure. but, uh, but thank you for what you do at the american space museum because it is a fantastic museum look if you've not been here come here this is one of the finest space museums outside of the Smithsonian, and i'd even say it's thank you farm. Thank you. Some of the things you see here, you don't see anywhere else. No, in the world. you won't. Uh, I it's can, incredible. We have a block one egress manual mm -hmm. for that. Uh, you know, uh, oh, you got that? I have no idea. Uh, so, listen, yeah. <laughs> you've got some amazing uh, things. Well, here. in fact, uh, the uh, NASA Kennedy Space Center, we loaned them mm -hmm. Rocco Patron's uh, yeah. hard hat, yeah. uh, as well as uh, the, uh, Norm Carlson's uh, Beans or Go uh, Bean. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. we <laughs> still, we, uh, we've got our first launches coming up from Lone Star. Yes. And we did. we've got Norm's recipe. Oh, do you? And we are going to be carrying on that same absolute tradition. Are you? Okay. Oh, are you kidding? Of course. Did we talked about that. Thank you for, for uh, again, uh, honoring our museum. Uh, we, uh, we are what we are because of you and your wife wanting to support us oh, in ways like uh, this impromptu book uh, signing that she wanted to do for us here. And, uh, and uh, they both know I love their book, her book, and I brag about it all the time. Thank that you. we're earthlings. And we need to be crewmates, not passengers on this ship. And the only border that matters is that thin blue line. And uh, uh, I was on a big campaign when that book came out there. People were tired of me saying it, probably. No, but it's what the heck book. is it's, it's yeah. the truth, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like uh, Nicole said today, we wake up every morning and guess what? We're on this thing right here, okay? And the only thing keeping me from flying off is gravity. And uh, so, um, uh, as we were mentioning there, I uh, wanted to get back to Lone Star, but mm -hmm. you mentioned something before I forget about who is going to be your launch services. Uh, oh, uh, company. we're very lucky. Are you going to farm them out to different ones? Actually, we, our first two missions are contracted with an incredible sort of best in class group of people. We've got our first missions headed to the moon, two of them with intuitive machines of Houston, Texas. 
the part of the NASA Eclipse Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. Okay. And both of those missions are flying on Falcon 9s with SpaceX. And when's the uh, date? That yeah, actually, we thought we would have been launching this week, um, but with pad congestion and other things, and Judah machines have told pad us. Pad congestion. Yeah. Those noisy yeah. rockets like last night, keeping the dogs barking. People are complaining about it, Marty. I know. Yeah. Didn't say hi to Marty Winkle, my co-producer and cameraman, and we've been doing this for almost uh, three and a half years. Marty, thank you so much for volunteering here today. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, you've been around Nicole Stott and Chris a lot, and uh, got any comment to say before? No. Okay. <laughs> Just on our <laughs> UCAC family microphone. Found the what, what I can say. They're they're great people. Oh, I, I really enjoy their company, and I enjoy listening to them. They can tell stories all day, and I sit here all day listening. That's right. Oh, absolutely. We have a mission to preserve the integrity and honor of the shuttle era, the 30-year shuttle era that has changed our world and allowed you to do what you're doing, and people don't realize that. And uh, just like uh, Chris Stott and his wife, Nicole Stott, I mean, she is the hardest-working astronaut out there. She loves Facebook, and I can't believe when I see a post and you're where, you know, uh, you keep those jets uh, uh, flying out there. And uh, uh, but uh, you were just at a, an event a couple of days ago with um, on Omega Watch. I she was, that. yes, she was up there. Uh, yes. yeah. And uh, so with yeah. Charlie Duke mm -hmm. and a bunch of other astronauts, Mike Masmino and Mike Lopez Alegria, yeah, and Peggy Whitson was there too. Peggy Whitson, too. Uh, fantastic. They're doing amazing. Uh, Axiom work with astronauts there. Yeah, they're but, doing amazing. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about that here. We yeah. want to get into a little bit. How did you become so smart that you know I'll do all this? No, I, no, mentors. But this is coffee, by the way, just in case. You're yeah, right, sorry. right, right. With uh, some uh, Irish uh, spiking wish. in there. <laughs> I wish. No, I've been, I've been fortunate. I mean, I was always, I had very supportive parents who allowed, uh, who really sacrificed to send me to some amazing schools. And then some incredible teachers who let me follow my passions. I had a... Uh, always had a passion for America. I love America. My dad brought me here when I was seven years old the first mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand why we left. I've always loved it. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. And we're going to talk about where you're from. Mm -hmm. In the Isle of Man, an incredible place. It's right. itself an incredible democracy as well. We're going to talk about that here in a second. Yeah. I'm trying to put my skip my in my brain here how we're going to do this chris no worries. let's uh, yeah. let's talk about the the lone star here okay and uh and uh why you founded lone star and some of the principles that you have behind it there here's yeah. uh here's your uh your mantra if i may sure absolutely is, uh say uh, lone star um our mission is to apply abundant thinking and exponential technologies to mm -hmm. the exploration of the moon and the endless possibilities of lunar storage mm -hmm. for the human race. That's one of your taglines there. Um, uh, you want to provide a secure storage mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm not sure what edge processing services means. I can to, talk you through that. Don't to me. our customers from the world's ultimate off-site backup location. You talk about the ultimate uh portable hard drive we got mm -hmm. it on the moon and not only the moon but chris has got specific craters and places on the moon uh that uh, we'll talk about and as we build our relationship with you you know i'm going to promote the heck out of those no, with well, better graphics you. down the line uh so uh you're open for business on your mm -hmm. website you uh email you uh what you might be interested in uh chris just just isn't for the magna carta and things like that how about the uh, uh, the Parks and Rec Department in uh, Titusville. Yeah, actually, they're on it. They're so, on it. Absolutely. No. So look, this I know. Look, I know it sounds strange. Storing data on the moon, data centers on the moon, right? And this is to back up everything that's happening here. This is to complement what's happening on the Earth. Um, especially as we have data centers in almost every country. If you could take a time machine and go back and look at the planet, and in a nice way, strip it down to the bedrock, tip the water and oceans off. And go back to say 1938, 39, and you'll see the beginnings of uh, Bletchley Park, what was happening in Honolulu. And you see these first data centers start to pop up. Mm -hmm. And then the growth goes exponential. And this, in the match of everything we've done in information technology with Silicon Valley and more around the world. And even today, there are more data centers opening. And the earth is becoming, if you imagine it, with data centers connected by cable fiber and satellite, one giant integrated circuit for the human race. It's an incredible 
piece of technology. These are the modern cathedrals that we're building. That's interesting. Modern cathedrals of technology. Absolutely. Well, yeah. they require a network of satellites like the Starlink and others that we're seeing. Oh, they're built. using them. Yeah, they're absolutely using them. Because you no, connect... I mean around the yeah. moon, though. A, a oh, no, for us. Around the moon. Yeah. No, no, for us, we're, we're lucky. So we're, we're going to be using uh, storage on the surface of the moon, and then we're going to be placing some satellites around the moon as well. Right. Uh, as we build out and look after various customers and what they're doing. But how this all started was we were approached by a group of customers. So this isn't technology push because mm -hmm. we're an integrator. You know, we're, we're like an airline. We we or like satellite operator. We'll, we'll we'll buy the aircraft. We'll buy the engines. We'll buy the livery, and we'll put it all together and sell it to our customers. We're amazing customers. Mm -hmm. And they came to us um, with a problem, and this is in 2018, and this is a year after or a couple of months after. Not Petya, N O T P E T Y A. Look it up. It's a terrifying cyber weapon that got loose. One of many that have gotten loose since actually. And it was used in the Russian-Ukrainian conflict uh, because there were a couple of international companies in Ukraine. I mean, this thing wiped out 80, 80% of all data on all computers in Ukraine, from the train station to the is Ministry of Finance right? to hospitals. And to that ADMs. is called Pet... Not Petia. Not Petia. You yeah. computer geeks out there know that, not Petia. How did it transmit it? And how did well, it, it was did on it, was networks. It, was it, did, it, did it take a minute? Did it take a half a second? Did it, it I, I, erase all that it data? It took about half a day. No, no, it started to, it's, it's like a virus. It's, it's just like the same way COVID spread around. Okay. So it spread into a couple of networks and a couple of computers and went on from there. But then it got into Maersk and, and FedEx and others. And great articles at Wired Magazine, some books written about this, okay. how it spread all over the world and people were running through data centers, literally ripping wires out of the walls. So because once, once a machine is contaminated, that's it. Oh, my gosh. And so, so these customers came to us in 2018. COVID-19 of the cyber waves. Sort yeah, of pretty much. In there. And they said they came and said, hey, you are something to do with space, right? I'm like, yes. He said, we have a problem. I'm like, okay. They said, can you help us solve it? I said, yes. And they're like, oh, they can see the relief on their faces. And then they sat down with me and I said, okay, what problem did I just say yes to? Yeah, you're going like, okay, now how am I going to do this? Yeah, now well, what is the problem? <laughs> and they told me, they told me this story about how that the, the global work is proliferating, how these data sovereignty laws where your data must stay in your country, right? Your American data, there's a law. The 104 countries have uh, these laws, data sovereignty, data localization, data residency. Some states of our union have this. American data has to stay in America. Mm -hmm. California data has to stay in California. It's all about jurisdiction. You, know, you can't generate data here and keep it in another place where the courts can't get at it or the government can't see it or regulators. So you have all this data, you have all these edge processing, and edge processing means you're just processing something far away from where you're, you know, you put another computer far away from yours and you process something far away and then send the results home. Right. Instead of bringing all the data back to one place to process. So you have this proliferation of data around the world. You know, every, throw the iPhones, throw the IoT devices, the Internet of Things, Throw going from enterprise data centers where you own your own data centers into the hyperscalers, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, and Equinix, and more. It's incredible. I mean, it really is one of the most amazing tools that humanity has ever created to help itself. Hmm. So then, as you're doing this, though, but where do you store the data safely? And so uh, we said, okay, we looked at everything. We looked at data centers underwater. Not a great idea. Yeah, underwater is cold, but we're trying to keep heat out of the oceans, not put it in. Yeah. There was a reason why Ocean Thermal Energy Exchange, OTEC, was like cancelled out in the 70s. It was doing horrific environmental damage then. These underwater data centers are doing horrific environmental damage today. Yeah. Just because something's a good idea from an engineering point of view doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea. Um, but bless them. Let them do their thing. Um, so we looked at deserts, jungles, on top of mountains, underneath mountains, and everywhere we looked down here. Everything's connected by the same network. So if your network is broken, if you've had network intrusion, someone's hacked into your network, whether it's a physical hack, a digital hack, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many data centers you have. It doesn't matter where the data's kept. You're at risk. And that's been proven time and time and time again. Terrestrial is broken. Uh -huh. And then throw in public switching networks, throw in, like I said, climate change, hurricanes, nation states are going after you. I mean, it's, it's horrific. There's so many pictures hack. If there's, a, if there's a movie out there you can't find and you know you saw that movie one time, like why is it on Netflix? Why is it not on Amazon Prime? Why can't I find that? It's probably gone. Wiped out by the North Koreans. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. the hmm. massive hack, the Sony Pictures hack. So huh, that's where the Marx Brothers went. Probably. That's oh, the, yeah. I think it was a couple of, got, and of course they lost a lot of the celluloid that got caught in fires. Right. Right. And then with Hurricane Irma, a lot of the data in the state of Louisiana got destroyed. Huh. Right. I mean, these things happen. Alexandria's 
happen yeah, is, all the time, right? Yeah. So how about we're, as, a, as I said, as evolved tool using apes, we take one of the greatest things we've done in the last 60 years, the space program, and we leverage that sunk investment and those gifts that it's, it has given us. Uh -huh. And we tie that in with the very best of Silicon Valley. And we bring data and space together. And we provide a solution that the human race has never, ever had. Couldn't have done this five years ago. Couldn't have done this two years ago. Really? Yeah. Even it's, only, it's, it's, it's that cutting edge in what we're doing. Um, working with incredible uh, providers like Skycorp. Let's Sky look Corp. at some of the... Oh, yeah. The, the, uh, some of the team that you're assembling that I know uh, companies like this constantly changing in ways. Uh, uh, there you are on the left, and I, I just pulled this off your website. I don't know who's that night. handsome fellow. No, that's, that's, that's Mark, Dr. Mark Matosian next to me. Mark's a former head of data centers at Google and former CEO, the U.S. CEO a of Google ISI. leader, so that he knows he knows his stuff there. Absolutely. PhD in orbital mechanics. He was also Teledesic okay. and amazing guy. Dr. Uh, sorry, Will Hawkins, uh, former U.S. Army a uh, fantastic guy, real specialist in disaster recovery as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, an amazing coder, works uh, with Commvault for many years, has his own uh, work. He works with people throughout the United States and more from government to com commerce about how to store and save their data, how to recover their data. Carol Goldstein, oh my gosh, the first ever woman VP at Morgan Stanley in the 80s. Morgan Stanley created, VP, wow. Yeah, created the satellite finance unit at Morgan Stanley. Literally then, I took a couple of companies, IPO, amazing. Then went to ING Bank in Amsterdam, did the same thing there, created the satellite finance unit, then ran all of global telecoms investing at ABN AMRO. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing professional. Uh, Dr. Del Smith uh, was actually shared a room with Von Braun. He was the, one of the first, he was the first ever NASA fellow sent to Cambridge, England to the, do space law as a young man. Came back and was actually uh, general counsel of uh, Com. Oh my gosh, give me a second on that one. He was the American company's. And I'm having a senior moment. Uh, that was a member of Intelsat. Early Comsat. senior. Of course, Comsat. Comsat. Well, Comsat. 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 Yeah, that was one of the early uh, communication. Wow. Yeah, and then and he then was also... Uh, Jim, uh... Oh, yeah. No, I was going to finish out on Dell because Dell was senior partner and senior advisor, space law advisor at Denton's and Jones Day sequentially. And they are two of the world's largest law firms. And because one of the first things we did at LearnStorm was like, can we legally do what we're doing? That was our first question. I'll get back to that. And then yeah. uh, James Burns Montante, former Honeywell, Draper, and others. He's our director of flight software, actually moving up to be our chief scientist. Um, uh, not on there because we've not made the announcement yet, but we're kind of doing it here. Uh, but press release will come out just after Thanksgiving. Uh, Steve Isley has joined us. He's the as our new president and chief revenue officer. And Steve is former VP of global sales and strategy at uh, Virgin Orbit. Reported straight to Dan Hart and uh, Richard Branson. Okay. Did an amazing job there. He's just joined us. Uh, and then on our main board, Jose Hernandez, uh, Dr. Jose Hernandez has just joined us, a uh, retired astronaut. Actually, he and Nicole flew together on one, uh, STS-128. And Jose's business acumen, his instincts, his intelligence, and his ability to drive through is absolutely fine. He's a CEO and founder of Tierra Luna, uh, one of our engineering consultants. And he's always been there lock stock and understands what we're doing. He's been amazing. So we're very lucky to have him join our, our main board. He was on our advisory board before that. Well, we know Hernandez, Jose, with his movie A Million Miles Away yeah. that we talked a mm -hmm. lot about when it came out. Marty, we saw the premiere at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, I got a little teary-eyed at some points there. Really, it was kind of got to yeah. you there. And I know he's personal friends of you and, and Nicole. Uh, 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 tell me, uh, tell our state yeah. curious people here that, that you've met a lot of people, okay? Mm -hmm. But you're pretty impressed with Jose, and he's oh, got a big much. winery. We love. We want to do a wine tasting Great here wines, at the museum by the way. now. Actually, fantastic. Well, we like to do a wine tasting here. He's well, going to well, be here two weeks before Christmas. Too. Oh my gosh! Well, think, th so hopefully you'll bring Dan some to bring some bottles. <laughs> yeah. So think about so the Tierra Luna, you know, Tierra Luna, Earth and same, Luna. Yeah, it's same Earth. as same as his wife's restaurant. Which my gosh, she's Michelin quality chef. Oh, is she? No, oh. she is one of the uh, Adele is one of the finest chefs I have ever had the privilege of. Oh dined with and and have i mean she's just stunning sure, good. oh my gosh oh i didn't get this way by osmosis trust me i do <laughs> enjoy the occasional michelin restaurant and she's better wow truly better huh. and so with jose's yeah. wife you're talking yeah about jose's that. wife was she how, was she portrayed okay in the movie I don't want you to be critical about it, but no, no, uh, no she's, you know, she's a she's a lot more glamorous and better. She was really than stood by her way. man and really yeah. was a, a yeah. uh, inspiration to Super him smart and, lady. And, and wanted him to do what he did. Yeah. And uh, if you haven't seen the movie, he was rejected. Yeah, the twelfth time Marty made it, 
talk, correct me there, but go ahead, yeah, Mark. Yeah, well, it is the 12th time, but Mark, I just had a thought. Why don't we do a, a wine tasting and a taste testing? There you go. There you go. Yeah. She's, she, she, yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, I hear, hear you. Absolutely amazing. Uh, gastronomy and culinary uh, 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 yeah. and winery at the same time. Well, I was going to tell you about the last two guys on, on our board there. Yes, sir. Right? So you've got Michael Potter, who is one of the co-founders of Global Connect, one of the Europe's largest data center companies. And before that, he was co-founder of Esprit Telecom, Europe's first ever pan, a deregulated pan-European telecoms company. But Michael, more importantly, we got to know each other. We both went to the same university, same grad school. We had different times. We joined the, the board of trustees of the International Space University the same day, sat next to each other, sort of finishing each other's sentences. It's uh -huh. like my brother from another mother. Wow. Um, he, we also make films together. He's a prolific and multi-award winning filmmaker. Amazing documentaries. Highly recommend them. Wow. about the space program and technology His and other name things. again michael potter P -O -T -T -E -R. Michael potter. Okay. yes great guy and also co-founder of geeks without frontiers an amazing charity that's changing well the geeks, actual, without, geeks frontiers. without frontiers geekswf.org and okay. then uh doing incredible work bringing the next half of humanity online around the world whether it's here at home with native american tribes or heading out to the middle east and doing work there and heading out to southeast asia and having the U.S. government ask them to help write legislation to try and fix some of these regulatory issues. We do things that are less glamorous, that actually have an impact. Hmm. And that's Geeks Without Frontiers, incredible team there. And we've also co-founded the Institute of Space Commerce together at change.space. Okay. Uh, that was, that's, you know, there's an Institute for Space Law. There's an Institute for Space Policy. Yeah, that's a whole other aspect of Chris Stott that we want to talk to you about someday. Chris, uh, uh, voice, uh, we got in a conversation with Rusty Swiker. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, go the, the BC 12 space pages. law yeah, absolutely. and yeah. Uh, yeah. China and mm -hmm. Senate things that need to be changed with uh, for the good of mankind with mm -hmm. uh, more cooperation. And we'll talk to you, have you back and talk more about that. Oh, no, but and then uh, I'll, 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 you can't let me finish. I can't, I can't leave Brad out. No, 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 I don't want oh, to leave anybody out here. I'm you. Oh, my gosh, I digress there. And everyone <laughs> says, No, no, so Brad, no, no, it's all right. No, so Brad Harrison is uh is our lead investor and an amazing guy in the uh, middle there in the middle there right there because like lone star is bc funded bc uh, means oh vi uh, venture capital okay ven so venture BC, capital venture bc capital. funded yeah, and it was actually tim copra uh colonel tim copra who flew with nicole and great guy too one of the few astronauts who actually have an mba amazing right. guy he founded blue bear capital and many other things current president of natarax fantastic okay. guy tim copra yeah and then tim introduced me to brad he fell off a bike and he did hurt himself up. yeah he did hurt himself but that hey but it worked out well it worked out plan. better because he, yes, he, he made did. an extended yes, set. yeah he did, he did really yeah, well but amazing I'd also love... an amazing business mind on tim too uh-huh and that's what you forget about the astronauts i mean they're incredible people in their own right but they're not just maniacal i mean they have incredible spread of, of intelligence and activities uh they're like the ultimate human swiss army knives they can ultimate do amazing human things, swiss right? army knife oh, that's well in the core of painting awesome. and writing yeah. and and so brad is former 82nd airborne and had worked at aol and had worked at a bunch of companies before founding scout ventures and has been one of the most inspirational vcs i've ever worked with and one of the most supportive and also one of the most enabling too just in, in i mean we're very lucky the team that we've put together because everything's about people you can have an amazing business idea but with the wrong team going nowhere yes yeah, so. uh, but if you have an amazing team and you get bumps in the road you're okay and that's what we've tried to do is put together a really good team of people it's a rainbow of talent that you need from some satellite technology mm -hmm. uh there with your dr dell to uh uh yeah uh, you know you need money uh, of, of course and and uh uh, seems to me uh you out there listening to this too like uh you might have a few people knocking on your door to to uh, get into your team because you're really oh no we and we will be hiring there. again soon no we're growing we're in saint petersburg florida and and why because it's an incredible place to be an entrepreneur uh we've got uh, an amazing ecosystem out there on the other side the other space coast we call it on the other side of the i4 space corridor where you've got incredible companies that have done amazing things throughout the Cold War, Cold War One, and now we're in Cold War Two, but in a great pool of talent. That's where Jim came from. I mean, he worked on the same chips that we're using. And by the way, our contractor, who's built our first data center for us, is Skycorp, Skycorp Inc. Okay. And they're based in Santa Clara, California, but their CEO, General Quas, Steve Quas, great guy, is based here in Lakeland. Hmm. So it's worked out incredibly well for us. And so Jim is actually working on those chips, the programmable gate arrays, uh, polar fire chips from microchip great great team what's the uh as you develop 
technology to store a hard drive on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the technical things simplified about the chips to prohibit cosmic radiation? Sure. And and uh, solar uh, radiation. Yeah, and just and just staying staying in the in the guide in the guide rails of because uh, I'm an American citizen, as you know, despite my funny accent. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time around international traffic and arms regulations. So you want to have a chip that is space qualified, that has flown before in space, so you understand its performance, and you have want to have one that is you're able to like a field programmable field programmable gate array. An FPGA means we can actually if there's is if so, there's a lock, you get a chip lock, a uh, gate lock, and we can actually reprogram the gates on it. You want something that is. Uh, that, that is good in radiation, and we that's, were, that's why uh, the, that's why microchips. Uh, great name for a company, by the way, microchip. They make microchips. Uh, we had Jay uh, uh, Chadlock on here, mm -hmm. the space station uh, gentleman, talked about uh, the ISS chips were purposely bigger because uh, radiation could go through them, cosmic mm -hmm. rays could go through them. If you compacted them, like in our smartphones, one radiation. Yeah, you get a charge point on to go. Yeah, we'll go through. Destroy a lot just, more. So yeah. I'm just. Yeah, so you use, you use RAID protocols, you do checksums on the data, and I know probably Jim and Will are just sitting there going, what Chris meant to say was, right? Yeah. But that's the beauty of a team. You have incredibly good technical people from space and data. You have incredibly good financial people, incredibly good leaders, incredibly good legal people. And you pull together a team, and my only job as CEO is to make sure they have enough coffee, <laughs> they have clear goals, right? They have all the resources they need, and uh -huh. then you step back. And if you trust your team and you've got a good team, they will make it happen. Well, I think you got you're a, a perfect person for that. But you know who taught me that? Uh, Is one of your fellow other guests who's come to speak here before. Uh, and Mr. Now, Jay uh, Honeycutt. Mr. Jay Honeycutt. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna talk about Jay here in a minute. Yeah, uh, amazing mentor. I've talked about right. my, my professors at school, but Jay yeah. was a professor at school to me. He was the first American to come teach us at the International Space University right. on the master's program. I, that is where uh, yeah, we'll talk about what do you have yeah. to talk about him a minute there? What do you um, that, that's uh, we're going to talk about Mr. Honeycutt there because, mm -hmm. uh, yes, we talked about it all fair there. What an influential man in a lot of people's lives, very much. And he just wasn't the center director, all right. But uh, and he's wanting to help our museum, yeah, with some things we talked about. Uh, let's put uh, uh, your your Lone Star uh, company here. Mm -hmm. Uh, why'd you choose that name and not Moonstar? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I, I was uh, like I said, I've always left America. And uh, for my first time getting lost at the Jefferson Memorial, right, and finding to read really? those words. Yeah. In Montpelier. Uh, well, no, D D.C. Oh, in D.C. Yeah, okay. no, the Jefferson Memorial in D.C. Okay. Absolutely. I'm just reading those words. Oh, gotcha. And having them, I'm just like, it was like a thunderbolt. It was just like, huh. it like shot right through me. And so I got my citizenship in Texas. But for me growing up, and then for the, in the world of darkness that we're facing today, I mean, every week that goes past, it's like the lights are going out again in Europe. The lights are going out again around most of the world. Uh, and I grew up in the 70s, and it was a miserable time. By the way, I am I rapidly hate communism and socialism. Socialism is just a slower form of death of a slower form of communism. Capitalism is an incredible tool. It's lifted more people out of poverty than anything else in human history. And it is a real struggle. And so when I grew up, uh, people around me, not my family, but people around me would be you know, saying negative things about America. It was the Cold War, a lot of propaganda. And yet every time I came here, every time I saw things with my own eyes, I would see that's not America. America is this. This America is what I'm seeing. It was Ronald Reagan, shining city on a hill. So Lone Star to me is the star of David, the star of Bethlehem. It is that guiding star. I got my citizenship in Texas. It is the Lone Star. And it is that shining city on a hill. I want every man, woman, and child around the world to be able to look at the moon every night and go, oh my goodness, look at what American entrepreneurs are doing there. They're helping every one of us save our data, save our civilization, and more with the energy and resources of the moon and everything else. I mean, our focus is data, and so, so many other companies are going forward to do more than that. Hmm. It is a movement, movement from scarcity to abundance. There's no need to fight over anything down here anymore. We have all the energy and resources of the solar system and more. And it's just that archaic form of thinking that is sadly still ingrained on both sides of the aisles and both sides of the world. Oh, it's like these old men, please go home. Let the younger crowd come in and just fix things. Sorry, I get on a hobby horse on that stuff. But no, I mean, this is a real moment. You've got mm -hmm. Astrobotic launching Christmas Eve on the United Launch Alliance Vulcan. You've got 
Intuitive Machine's first mission. They're doing three missions next year to the moon. Mm-hmm. So you've got two companies headed to the moon commercially uh-huh. for the first time. India, amazing. Incredible uh, story just, of India. Oh my and, gosh. and their orbiter is, uh, we just saw, saw some pictures of the mm-hmm. Apollo 12 landing site yeah. with the orbiter that puts our lunar reconnaissance orbiter to shame. You think you're looking at a drone of it. Yeah. There. Well, I mean, think yeah. of this. Indian Space Research Organization founded in August 1969. And ISRO is an amazing, it's helped India manage its resources, grow its technical population. And that has the largest middle class of any country in the world. There are more people in the middle class working in technology in India than there are people in America. Oh, I know. It's just a billion people. People don't realize. Oh, it's just a little bit smaller than China. Oh, no, it's actually wise. bigger than China now. Oh, is oh, it? China's got a real problem on their hands, and we'll talk about that in a second, too. Um, demographics, one of the most, misused, most misunderstood words of our present day. Uh-huh. Um, but India is the largest English-speaking democracy really? in history. Yeah. English speaking democracy English, is in yeah. India. Yeah, that's a English, Jeopardy English question, is the legal, isn't it? The legal, it's, it is the yeah. Well, that's just it. Uh-huh. It is English is the lingua franca. They have 143 different 143. Forgive me, maybe 100. It's just Diwali too. My favorite. Both my godsons are from India. Yeah. Um, okay. My favorite time of the year, Diwali. Oh, I love that. But English is the lingua franca for all in India. Huh. And think about that. It's also a country that, you know, I became a citizen from the Isle of Man, that threw off English rule too, didn't it? Yeah, so look at that. You've got America and India, and what's the one country that tries to keep us apart the whole time? China. Okay. They're terrified of, of India. Huh. I mean, Japan is a boogeyman from the past, but India, if you look at the encirclement of India, it's astounding. From what the Chinese have done in Burma, Myanmar, Tibet, what they've done in Pakistan, and what they've done in Sri Lanka, it's all to close in the largest English speaking democracy of pure entrepreneurial talent you've ever seen. And who has displaced most of the Chinese-led companies in Silicon Valley? Well, that would be Indians. Indians, yeah. Incredible. Oh, my gosh. I've, I've, uh, I love it. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I've, no, no, not at all. I, I mean, we're I, so lucky to have people from India to come here to be American citizens. And we're lucky to have Chris Stott here, given his global view that we rarely get here. We're so down here in our little rocket center here. Uh, but uh, no, it's... the heart of the universe. Uh, yeah. but it, this it's is become the heart of the universe. Stars. It really has. Yeah. It's... This is, is the, the porthole to the stars. Mm-hmm. Um, we wanted to just get to yeah. one last thing about the de- your company. Here. Oh, yes, we did. Uh, well, we, we were given a choice. So we've got our first mission headed up with Intuitive Machines and uh, and, and SpaceX on, the, so far, the week of January 12th. So when the launch window opens. Okay. All right. We'll be covering that here on Stay Curious. So. Uh, and, no, thank you. And we were given a choice. So with the, it's amazing. So the state of Florida, so avant-garde, so forward-thinking and protecting our state and our citizens data they have taken the entirety of our data storage on board that mission because they want to be able to they want to be able the to take florida a state, the state of the government of florida state. government of florida has all of their data not all of theirs no they took all of our capacity on board oh with it with the data set oh. so actually the data set that they're using there is parks uh, state parks and others so when you said titusville i'm like is yeah that right yeah okay we'd be looking for something that was unregulated data that would represent florida because this is a piece of florida being stored by a floridian company going to the moon from florida so it's it's a it's a lovely thing and then going forward they're working with us as well because they see the importance of leveraging their investment in space that will be interesting we'll keep track the, of yeah. that through you chris for sure on there but then we have to transmit a document to the moon and back and there's our declaration of independence yeah. that was actually we created that with mid journey and yeah, I, right. yeah, one of one of the one of the machine learning tools. So you yeah. want to transmit that to the moon, and then it be able to be transmitted back to Earth. Actually, a little different. So what want. we're doing? So we're doing a test of the concept of operations, conops. So this is our first of two missions for test flights. So we wanted to store something on board. State of Florida has done that. It's amazing. And as we transit to the moon, as we go to the moon, and then as we orbit around the moon, and then from the surface of the moon, we want to be able to send a document and get a different document back, send and receive, refresh, restore, right? Just we're using, well, with their kind permission, we're using Intuitive Machines Nova Sea Lander as, as a hard drive. Mm-hmm. And so what we're doing is as we go to the moon and orbit and come back and forth, so we, what was the first, what's to be the first document transmitted off planet for digital storage ever in human history? And, um, and you want it to be the Constitution. Actually, the Declaration of Independence. I mean, Declaration of Independence. Absolutely, yeah. Well, no, I'm an American. I think Marty's right? got a. Uh, Marty claims that he has something to do with the first document. Oh, the, no, this document's on the moon. 
This is the first one transmitting. Yes, we're, yeah. we're understand. Yeah. But digital storage. Yeah. Yeah. He clarified it, our Marty, but uh, we're going at a, a Marty. Tell us where you were going with that. But, though this will be the first transmitted, what is one of the first documents ever left on the moon? Well, one of the first is our launch team on Apollo 11. Our names are on the moon. Nice, including yes. mine. Yes, you put it on the mylar and yep. acid etch with a special pen, right? Yeah, and we nice. talked about that. On yeah, there. so uh, and there's. I'm sure there's a lot of Kilroy was here on some of that equipment that's on the moon too. Uh, and Wouldn't you, under 30 years, 40 years old, have no idea who Kilroy was probably, but uh, I don't. But uh, well, they'll learn again soon. We've enjoyed just technical part. We could talk to you ad nauseum, and we will in the future. Oh, and you've given me so it's uh, spending the Declaration of Independence, yeah. right, and then transmitting back the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Oh, okay. Yeah, and someone said, "Won't that upset the Chinese?" And I said, "Well." <laughs> We sincerely hope so. Yeah, we sincerely hope so. Yeah. yeah, the idea is to shine a light in the darkness. Let people see this. Let people remember why we're Americans okay. and what it is to be an yeah, American. Great. What are our founding oh, documents? Man. What What do we actually believe in as Americans? And when might that happen? January the 12th. We're going to do it January, when you're launching January the 12th. Yeah. So the moment we launch it and we're in transit, that's when the documents, uh, two of the machines have us on the roster. The documents will be sent backwards and forwards. We'll do all these tests. All right. Okay. Yeah. And all then right. the second mission goes up in March. And that's the first ever purpose-built data center off planet Earth. Wow. Now, we did a software-defined data center on Space Station back in December 21. In your landing sites, you're thinking about. Oh, well, land, well we, we're landing on the South Pole. Uh, okay. Because we're hitchhiking we got, this time. I actually had a, a, a moon globe here. It's pulled up. It, I had Charlie Duke autographs. So the South Pole. Yep. Uh, why there? Uh, oh, well, because that's where Intuitive Machines is going. The NASA. Okay. Those are the landing sites. There's a lot of other people flying on these missions. Uh -huh. So you've got ice drills on the second one we're going on. You've got rovers. You've got radio okay. astronomy So telescopes. it's part of the looking for the water on the moon. And I guess this so. is our, our, yeah. our place for humanity to first build a, a station there. So we're good. Yeah, that's so great. Intuitive Machines are like an amazing FedEx to the moon. Taking a lot of different people's things to the moon, where we can all do things. Intuitive machines. We've talked about them before, and we'll really get behind this and, and uh, learn more mm -hmm. with Chris along the way about this uh, uh, amazing concept and cutting-edge technology. Uh, we're going to move on to where you grew up and a little bit about uh, yeah. your wife there. But the final uh, thing you want to say about uh, uh, saving humanity's uh, data? No, I mean, okay. this is your baby pictures. Right. Yeah. That this is is uh, from the Parks and Rec Department of Titusville. What they did uh, with the school lunch or summer lunches to your baby mm -hmm. pictures to your financial uh, this empire. Everything. This is a living, breathing archive connected twenty four hours a day by broadband to the planet. A couple of years. This sounds strange now, but a couple of years from now, people will this become routine, not in a negative way, but in a way that oh well, of course, of course, you store our data yeah. on the moon. Of course, we don't keep anything valuable down here yes. we keep a copy of it up there just yeah. in case because we can hey look how it's yeah. changed folks uh the the last time you burned a cd did you know that was going to be the last time you burned a cd no uh you didn't plan someone, someone, that someone, all of a sudden no. you pick a thumb you, someone, you someone gave a us thumb a drive in there someone gave us a dvd player the dvd it was very kind of them i'm like what are we going to do with this <laughs> I don't, I don't have a DVD player anymore. Who, who does? <laughs> who does? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, that's just it. Our entire, we're living in a software. We do. We have world. a lot of archives to look at here yeah. of, of DVDs, yeah. of, of shuttle launches and stuff. But no, well, it's, it. it's, but it's, it's, all, it's all up in the air. It, I yeah. mean, it's in this database somewhere. Well, the, yeah, the cloud isn't a cloud. The cloud is a bunch of uh, soccer sized stadium building sized buildings, right, buildings full yeah. of servers and racks and everything else. And you're going to put that out. on the moon, so to speak. Yeah, we're putting we're putting a space uh, qualified version of that on the moon. Okay. Yeah, much much easier. Well, we're going to stay in touch with uh, Chris uh, uh, Stott. I've been wanting to talk to you for about a year about this, actually, since uh, uh, Nicole uh, so graciously did our astronaut memorial in January, uh, and uh, so. But I want to talk a little bit about where you grew up. It's yeah. Very unique place uh, there. Uh, it's right there in the middle, right? Yes, it is. The Isle of Man. Yeah. Marty's right there in the, in the center there. Uh, so those come you down a bit, Marty. Come down. There you go, right in the middle, Marty. Right there. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Uh, uh, Beautiful place. If you get the chance to go visit, do so. I mean, so what are we looking at? The size of Long Island? or uh, uh, Three times the size of Manhattan. Okay. All right. It does uh, look like Manhattan to me. Yeah, 35 of. miles. Well, 35, 33 north-south, depending which way you do it. Nice cumulus across. clouds over there on yeah. a clear day there. Absolutely. 
uh, on there. And uh, you go back frequently, don't you? I'm back every couple of weeks. It's an incredible place to do business. Couple of weeks? Yeah. All right. We have a uh, fortunate to have Lone Star there. We have a, a US, an Isle of Man subsidiary called AS Noah, which means New Moon and Max. Uh huh. And I've got the Mansat group of companies, which I'm just executive chair of now. Okay. And we've been doing a lot of work there. And, but there's a lot of space companies. That is one of what you're seeing there is one of the world's centerpieces, one of the highest concentrations of space companies anywhere in the world outside of the United States. My gosh. Yeah. Didn't know that. We'll be looking into that a little bit more there, yeah. for sure. From manufacturing to business to everything. Huh. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, you're proud of your heritage, and I, I know indeed. you're proud of your wife, but you're also proud of this guy. Uh, and uh, tell, tell I, I heard the story about how you met Mr. Jay Honeycutt here, mm -hmm. and he told me that um, this young man got a hold of him and uh, that you were at the... Uh, what was the class? Oh, it's, it's the International Space University. Yes, the International Space University. Yeah, doing in, the Master in Space Science, their first class. The first class, and yeah, you asked like uh, him to get a hold, uh, to talk at your commencement there. Kind of, yeah. Jay was actually the first professor, who came, American professor who came yeah. to see us. It was really cool. Uh, he came and talked to us about the space shuttle program and shuttle operations and how the Kennedy Space Center was using, it was driving all these changes forward. Right. And no, it was amazing. Well, uh, I asked him, I said, I said so... Uh, uh, they said Chris just kept calling me and calling me up about stuff and taking me out to lunch and getting to know me about this and that, and so I hired him to do it to to, to work for me. Mm -hmm. And I go, wait a minute, Mister Honeycutt, uh, work for you? What, what were you Kennedy Space Center director then? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah I was. You know how he is, so humble about it. You know, yeah, that's what I was doing. I'm going. Uh, how'd he get to your office so 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 easily there? He says, I don't know. I just kept picking up the phone. There's Chris Stott. And, and next thing I know, he becomes one of my bubbas. That's it. I was a bubba. I was very lucky, very fortunate. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, the time of my life. Uh, just, I, so I can much. imagine. I mean, I'm so jealous of that. Okay. Oh. Getting to know this gentleman and his influence behind the scene on so many careers. Uh, uh, this gentleman is a Mr. Fix-It that was sent in by NASA to straighten up the uh, first the uh, simulation department in Johnson Space Center where mm -hmm. he was a manager of that. Didn't straighten it all up, but, you know, helped mold it the way it he was. He did win the Presidential Medal of Freedom for saving Apollo 13. Yes. Yep. He, and he never mentions that. Never mentions that, uh, uh, And um, uh, then he, same thing with the, the, the freedom, uh, freedom, shuttle freedom. Space Station. Yes. And then they're moving on to the shuttle. And he program, says so. he had Tip Talone yeah, from the, go yes. out there and check out what was going on at the station. And yeah. then Tip comes back and reports and says, we need to change some things. And Jay told Tip to pick your uh, draft, draft who you want. You can mm -hmm. pick the first string draft what you want. And he says, doggone, they took the whole stot away from me and took her out there. And yeah. uh, so uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's setting up about what you and your wife know about this. No, it's a, Tip, Tip is the best says, man at our wedding. Oh, yeah. Awesome. We had, we had two, I fortunately had two weddings. Had one on the beach with Tip, and he was the best man when Nikki and I got married just north of New Smyrna Beach. Okay. And that was lovely. And then... You didn't know very, each other very long, did you? Not that long, no. But when you know someone, then you just know. Yeah. And that was it. And then I married my best friend. Right, what can I say? And it's just beautiful. incredible. It's, and then uh, got married on the Isle of Man, too. So that was, yeah, more of a church wedding in a good way. But that was, yeah, do both. There's another good picture, picture of Jay, uh, Jay yeah. at our shuttle fest, and he'll, he's yeah. uh, going to be involved in some other projects. And I can tell you, we're, we're opening the first mission control for ourselves at Lone Star over at the Maritime and Defense Hub. That's why Sid Beats are good, too. Allison, Lauren, and the team are there. have been amazing for us. And it's the JF Honeycutt Mission Control. Really? Yeah. That'll be opening up mid-December. Okay. Well, you're going to tell me about that mm -hmm. so we can get... Uh... Yes, well, I was mentioning it now. Right, right. And, uh, well, awesome. That's... Uh... Uh, well, I mean, he was president of Lockheed Martin Space Operations. He won the Presidential Medal of Freedom for saving Apollo 13. And he did all of that work in the space shuttle and the space station programs and all of that work on simulations and training and training and training. And taught. I was so fortunate to have someone like that teach me about management, and about uh, goals, and just basically how to be, the be how to try to be the best manager you can. Mm -hmm. And every lesson I've learned has been from Jay. Hmm. All the well, time. it's proud every to be time. somebody's disciple, isn't it? Well, yeah. In, in, in a way that, that you can carry it it's on. It's very much mental. Because yeah. uh, uh, 
Well, you very much carry on those those values there, yeah. Chris. And we ask forgiveness, not permission. That's right. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> those are good philosophies, <laughs> especially right. in engineering. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. that was good for as a photographer making a career too. Yes. Get the picture and then forgiveness that you're trespassing or whatever you had to do to get that. Uh, there's the call. Yeah. Trespassing. I know. <laughs> yeah. God. Uh, there's Nicole there. One yeah. of her classic photos there. We had mm -hmm. a, a great event with the Scholarship Foundation. Uh, we talk about her book all the time. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about uh, the reaction to her book? Has been certainly very positive. Well, you know, the best reaction. I mean, it's a great book. And I don't say that just as, as Nikki's husband. Well, why do you say it's a great book? What, because it's one of the first books ever written by an astronaut that actually talk, talks about tackling the problem I, of climate I change. I agree with you 100%. Yes. It's, it's not about, I dreamed of being an astronaut and I became it. Not that there's nothing wrong oh, with Oh, no, those books. are great books, too. Okay. Yeah, this is a different but, way. She but, used to platform. Uh, she incorporates her experience in space mm -hmm. with, I didn't know about coral reefs I photographed, and now I learned all about them. And yeah. my God, we got to, they're so important to our planet, you all can't believe it. But that's the, what I learned from her book. Okay. Well, the best thing I, I saw is in classrooms. And it's a great reaction. It's a somewhat frightening and sobering reaction. It's when young people, no matter what the age, they come to her and they say, you're the first person to tell us that climate change is solvable, that we're not all doomed. Uh -huh. And we've all been a bit shocked. Well, like, well, of course it's solvable. That's the whole point of the space program. That's what we're all doing. And we're already solving climate change. Who told you it was doom and gloom? Yeah. Right. And you get back to the socialist and communists because, you know, they, they love that kind of stuff. But it really is. It's like that has been the biggest shock to me and the best reason to read that book. Mm -hmm. And to say to people, look, you have a choice in the future. You can make a positive future, a better future. And she gives an example in every chapter of how that is not just may happen, but is happening. Mm -hmm. And that is why that book is so powerful. It, it is powerful. And, and the friends that you both made along the way, oh, it, I mean, it's chock full of 25 different people in there that are trying to make a difference. Yeah. And there's so yeah. many more we couldn't get. Yeah, the yeah. Right? it's great. Looking forward to a part two someday on there. Yeah. But. but that's the whole point of the space program. Mm -hmm. That's the only point of the space program it is. is to make life better down here. That's, that's right. The only thing. And it has. The shuttle. Yeah is the bedrock for so much going on in the space station and uh we need to find out what we're going to do in the next 50 years well that's it evolved tool using apes moving from scarcity to abundance dr peter diamandis talks about this so very well uh highly recommend his books uh abundance and bold and more with him and steve cotton doing this but peter is also founder of the international space university founder of the singularity university founder of SEDS, founder of the x prize and it's all about moving that needle Mm -hmm. And the space program is at the very beating heart of that. Absolutely. And we appreciate what you're doing to move the needle. And, and Nicole's awareness that I love is, of course, the yeah, famous Apollo 8 uh, uh, that I was a teenager watching this unfold yeah. on December, Christmas Eve. What is your Earthrise moment? <clears throat> and uh, uh, what does Nicole mean about that? Not necessarily the Earth rising physically, right? No, or the Earthrise moment. That was the first time. That was has been cited as the beginning of the environmental movement when for the first time we saw what we look like from afar mm -hmm. it's a change of perspective uh, dr frank white dr frank white talks about the uh overview effect uh, ron garen talks about the orbital perspective all right the idea being that you know it's like we're all in this together as nikki says we're all you know we're all humans we all live on planet earth the only matter, border that matters is that thin blue line, and we need to be crew, not passengers. But we're finally making this move as a species, not just into space. Mm -hmm. I mean, so Arthur Clarke is a great, also a great mentor and a great friend, and he was very cool in getting me. He has one, he's the one who got me to International Space University, which is then I met Jay, and then Jay got me to here, and I met Nicole. So it's like a causational set of dominoes that have changed my life, and thank you, Lord. Um, but you look at that, he said the first time. Um, from then on, from the moment Apollo took off, Apollo 11, he said that was the first, that was the pivotal moment in history. Every every time someone talks about a ship after that, they won't think about ships on the seas, they'll think about ships in space. And it's that, that change of perspective. All of a sudden we went, oh, wow, look at that. Oh, my gosh, look at the bounties of the solar system of the universe that are ours. Mm -hmm. Let's move away from this knife fight in a telephone booth over resources on the planet 
I mean, that is, that's like putting leeches on your body in the Middle Ages. Yes. It and is. unfortunately, we've got a group of people going through society at the moment who have not yet to learn that lesson. The one that I loved most was when you saw uh, the actor William Shatner. Incredible actor, by the way. And someone who has professionally learned how to control his emotions. That's what he does as a professional. Right. I mean, incredible actor. He came off that new Shepherd flight. And there you saw Mr. Bezos, who was uh, saying to him, how do you feel? And let's have a glass of champagne. And Mr. Shatner, who, who was a professional, multi-award winning actor. I mean, by the way, incredibly brave to do that, too. Yes. I mean, to become an astronaut after, you know, I mean, amazing that he did that. Uh, very brave. And yet he couldn't control his emotions from the beauty and the depth and the world-changing impact that overview effect had on him. And that's it. Every astronaut. He was sobbing. He was, yeah. he was sobbing. Yeah. And, 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 and half a year later, he still says that it is impacted. What he yeah. saw. It's it so fragile. And, and it, you know, just, yeah, it's really. Yeah. Uh, have you got a ticket to ride? No, uh, I, 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 I karma not. We call them karma not. Karma not. No, I, I would love to do that one day, but I, uh, maybe you yeah. will. Maybe, I, I, maybe I have you'll do fun. it together one day. Yeah, cool. I have more fun putting things in space. Yeah, well, that's uh, <laughs> it's, it keeps well, me calm. Well, we have enjoyed this conversation with you certainly enough. We're going to have you back and talk about some other things here. Uh, and, that's it. We're not going to talk uh, about the Institute of Space Commerce. Yeah, with Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell. Oh my we gosh, have another we gotta do that. Yeah, well, come on, let's do it. Well, uh, yeah. Look, so, the, and that's the other thing too. So, there's institutes for space policy, yeah, and sure. space law, but then no one ever talks about the commerce of space, oh, right? And right. how that impacts our economies and the value of it. And, and we can learn case studies, lessons learned. You go to a business school, they give you case studies, right? At the Institute of Space Commerce, it's case studies, and so but we were fortunate. There was the first ever book written about the economics of space. It was in 1979. It was a collection of essays by uh, Dr. Jerry Pornell, okay. twice PhD, one PhD in political science, another in computer science. And he wrote about how science and technology can fundamentally improve the lives of every man, woman, and child. He said not just surviving, but surviving in style. Uh, Larry Niven, his co-author for all these books, I think 37 times best-selling together. New times best -selling Larry books. Niven, yeah. And, they, and he, he wrote the introduction to that. Jeff Bezos quotes directly from Larry's introduction, hmm. as does Elon, as do they all. So you can go back and, and look at the introduction. Is is oh, basically, Larry was saying to saying, look, let's read Jerry's book. And Larry, Larry was great. He's, 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 he's now our patron. Jerry was our first patron at the Institute. Oh, OK. And then Larry be, and he sadly passed. And then Larry became our patron, who's amazing, too. And Larry said, look, I like to go backpacking. I'm, I'm summarizing. Go read the book. Right. You can get it on Amazon. And economics says, of space oh it's called uh it's called a step farther out a step farther a step out. farther right. out okay and that's what our institute is based on so larry said i'd like to go backpacking in the in, up in the mountains behind los angeles and someone built a huge chemical plant and now i can't go backpacking this is this is bizarre why are we putting why are we putting anything that why are we putting bad things into our life support system same way like nicole writes about this why we how can we have a space station that mimics carbon war clean water clean air protects us from radiation, does all these things, and we have the planet. And so Larry was saying, this is barbaric, and he's very right. It's barbaric what we're doing. Take all that heavy industry and put it in orbit where you've got more resources, more energy, huh. and it's cleaner, and it, it serves the human race. Yeah. And return Earth to being in Eden. And young Jeff Bezos read that, and that's what he's doing now. It's incredible what's going on. So there's La there, was, there was Larry and, and, and Jerry. And they were the guys who brought together, I think it was, I think it was Larry's house in Burbank. It was all written up. And they brought, brought in the for, uh, someone who was to be the head of NASA, someone who was to be the president of the United States, and some incredible generals, and said, look, how do we beat the Soviet Union? Well, let's, let's do it. And they came up right. with the SDI, the, the Strategic, Strategic Defense Initiative, yeah. the SDI program, Star Wars. And let's outspend them. Let's use the greatest weapon in all of human history, the U.S. dollar. Let's improve our technology. Let's do something amazing for us. And then let's bankrupt these sons of bitches. And there were about eight space shuttle DOD missions that coincidentally were in that mm. time frame you're talking about that bankrupted the Soviet Union uh, yeah. or trying to keep Larry up with Star Jerry. Wars. Exactly. That was Larry. It was all on purpose. It was yeah. great. Those premeditated, wonderful thing. But also, when Jerry wrote A Step Farther Out, um, at the same time, and he wrote it in response to this, a, a, a group of people called, and bless their hearts, called the Club of Rome. They're still around, they're still out there doing their thing. Yeah. 
Okay. They had a computer model generated, and Jerry had a PhD in computer science in those days. And they had a computer model generated by a great team of people at MIT. And you've ever heard the expression garbage in, garbage out? Sure. Right. So we looked at this computer model and the Club of Rome, oh my gosh, professional doomsayers. They were like, oh no. Yeah, you've met the you've met the type of the world. Uh-huh. They're not right. the type of people to hang around a space program. They come in and they go, Oh, we're gonna we're all gonna starve to death. There's gonna be too many people. We're gonna die of pollution. Oh, uh. Uh, and you know, yeah, they become were filled with population oh. nightmare. Yes, so. and that's where it came from. And so these people are professional doomsayers. They're, you know, it's, it's they're professional negatives. Mm-hmm. You know, you find these people who sound intelligent by saying no all the time. Well, that'll never work. Right. <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh my gosh, these are the people. If they'd have been in charge, we never would have walked out of the cave. Right. We never would have had fire. Right. <laughs> and so, I mean, th- those are the that's that crowd. And there's a lot more of them, sadly, than there are of us. But Jerry said, hang on a minute, time out. You've missed the impact of technology and exponential technologies and computers and high tech. And you've missed it. We are going to have an incredible future, not the future you're predicting. And they keep, by the way, we were supposed to have all died in 1980, 1985. They keep right. changing their predictions. And there was a guy named Paul Ehrlich and the population explosion and so forth. Yes. That we would never, six billion people would not be sustainable on yeah, Earth. Now I'm close to eight and a half. Yeah. Right. And so and so you look at this. Right. And so Jerry was like a, he was like not just a, a voice in a hurricane. He was a candle in the hurricane. One point of light saying, hang on a minute. You've got this wrong. And we went back with Northern Sky Research, an incredible team. They're now part of Analysis Mason with Jerry's help. And we looked at his initial numbers and graphs that he did on the first computers back then. Mm-hmm. And 30, 40 years later, we checked it both times. Club of Frome's data was like, yeah, wrong, 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 wrong. Jerry's was spot on. I mean, like spookily correct on the curves, technology curves, wealth created and everything else. And so we were like, wow, okay, that's interesting. And that's why we formed the Institute. And the idea being that when you go look at these people, these sci-fi writers who are multi-PhD, incredible people who sit there and challenge our assumptions, make us think, well, what happens if I do this with technology? What might happen to society this way or that way? And they make a good living out of it. But it's like R and D. It's like a, a voice and a guide for us in the space industry. Science fiction, you're saying? Yeah. It's like research and development. Oh, completely. Right there. That's that's absolutely because it's the first time in human history that we can prove. You heard the old adage: "Does life imitate art, or does art imitate life?" Mm-hmm. It's the first time we can prove it. Yeah. Okay. That life imitates art. Yeah. You go back to the early. Yeah, like we talk about the unbroken chain from the early sci-fi writers, all the way from Alexander Dumas to Jules Verne, his law, his his clerk. From Jules Verne, you know, around the world in 80 days, 20,000 leagues under the sea, from the earth to the moon, the first, they're talking about shooting cannons from out of landing capsules off the coast of Florida, right? Right, from right, going to the exactly. moon and everything else. Columbia. And how he got together with two young writers who were good friends and who were struggling at the time, and that was Arthur Conan Doyle and H.G. Wells. Hmm. And how Arthur Conan Doyle and H.G. Wells then helped Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke was pen pals with Robert Heinlein. And Isaac Asimov. Isaac Asimov and Robin Heinlein were lab partners during World War II. Heinlein was U.S. Navy, but got tuberculosis, couldn't fight. That way he went and did this. And all the way from him, all the way down to do through Gibson, through Stevenson, all the way down today through Scalzi and others. It's an incredible unbroken chain. It is. But people wow. just turn around and go, what if? What if you have a better future? And then you look at the impact. And you look at the proliferation recently, too, of all the Star Trek TV shows. Not by accident. You look at that one idea that Gene Roddenberry had and said, look, why don't we just say to people, look, let's let's give people a positive aiming point in the future. When have you so ever Gene doing... Roddenberry, you're talking with Star Trek. Star, Star Trek, and, yes. And, yeah. uh, groundbreaking because it was mm-hmm. uh, one of the first uh, uh, TV things that shared diversity and, and inclusion. Absolutely. And it was one of the most... I mean, yeah. the most uh, Roddenberry's sub- a genius, yeah. you think, over there. Oh. One of the most subversive television shows ever, and it got right past the censors at the time because they couldn't figure out what it was about. <laughs> yeah, they just yeah. thought, oh, it's, look, it's like spaceships and aliens. And it's like, well, all of us watching were like, wow, that was political. Wow, that's a really... And we started to get a positive vision of the future. And again, think about the Club of Rome. Doom, 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 doom. Yeah. Think about what we're finding in schools today when the coal is out there firing. Doom, doom, doom. There's an old adage that if you believe you're going to be hanged in the morning, you'll find a way to make it happen. <laughs> right? And so if you give someone a positive aiming point to say, right. look, let's think about a better future. That's why I love Disney. Robert McCall's artwork, uh, which we use prolifically with his family's permission in, in our work too, 
the idea being that you go and see a better future you visualize it a lot of martial arts is as well it's the same thing positive mental imaging you, right. you do it you, you, if you if you, if, you not, if you think you're not going to break the board you won't if you think you can you will and that's the whole space program riding to heaven on a pillar of fire right. and doing amazing things here's how we can not why we can't exactly one of jay's sayings that's right have it yeah. up there on the wall exactly and uh, uh yeah so uh, that's it go get it done exactly yeah. so this commerce um huge facility blue origins built mm -hmm. uh yes they're, they're taking the small steps fiercely mm -hmm. and uh a lot of people don't realize that's what it's all about is space commerce yes he course. wants to this this new glen is so huge when he mm -hmm. launches it it will have four times the fairing space of anything that's been launched so far and yeah. bingo we're putting up factories you, you say exactly this is just the beginning Think of that, the two wealthiest human beings in all of human history. Yeah, right here right, in Florida. <laughs> right here in Florida, who have chosen to dedicate their lives to building private space programs and spending their wealth to do so, spending their limited time in the universe to do so. Huh. Think about that. Yeah, right. you know, I was thinking about the Starship that uh, this morning launched, launched this amazing. morning. Amazing! Oh and my gosh, uh, we were watching live. That was incredible. Yeah, and I thought, oh about, my you know, gosh, uh, wow! Hats uh, off to SpaceX. Well done, yeah. everyone at SpaceX. Mind blown! Incredible. I go, uh, Musk just did something that uh, the Soviet Union could not do yeah. with their N one rocket, yeah. which uh, had thirty engines and all that. Their moon rocket failed, and that's why we beat them. Mm -hmm. And here we got a private entrepreneur. Granted, fifty years later, mm -hmm. but uh, oh, boy, that is sent to. Let's just uh, say that. An American entrepreneur, yeah, just did something a superpower couldn't do. Right, yeah, and, still and we've hasn't got done. two amazing American entrepreneurs and their teams of incredible people mm -hmm. who are dedicating their lives to this. I mean, they're not on the stock market doing things. They're not off doing. I mean, they're doing this. Yeah, has you know? Chris Stott met the Bezos or Musk? I've been a couple of times. We've been very fortunate, and they're incredible gentlemen. Uh huh. Amazing people. They, they, I'm sure they like what you're doing. I, I'm a customer of theirs, which is the nicest, that's the nicest compliment I can give them. That's awesome. In a very good way. That's good. Yeah. No, I mean, well, thank them for their work because I then buy their product from them and do something oh, else. Oh, no, right. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, uh, that's beautiful. We're looking forward to great things Sir Richard Branson, Luna's great guy, too. You can't miss Sir Richard. He's doing amazing yeah, things. Yeah, Sir Branson. Oh, yeah, we only have point three point. billionaires yeah. doing things here. Yeah, only three. Uh, in our he has state. a green card, so he's paying taxes in America. Don't that's forget. That's right. That. And that's what I can't understand. You get all these people out there and they, 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 they get so... Um, I was going to say the word butt hurt, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on this. But they're like, they're like, oh, what are they doing with their money? And I'm like, they're saving the human race. Yeah, they are right. literally saving every man, woman, and child on this planet. And you're saying that's the wrong thing to do? How much do you think that rocket launch that cost uh, uh, Musk this morning? I, you, you know, know I, uh, yeah. No, but it probably. Uh, well, I mean, it's, you know, it'd be very fortunate to meet some of his like investors, that, maybe, like maybe. Steve Jurvetson and yeah. uh, Mariana Serenko over at Future Ventures, who are incredible. My point is, yeah. he's willing to do that mm -hmm. with his own money yeah. for humanity. Now, we yeah. know that there's seed money from NASA, and, and, and that's, that's what well, I mean, they, they the were government needs to do. Is, yeah, is, yeah, is, of course. Is, and the Department of Defense has been amazing. Yeah. Don't forget, we're all in this together. And that's the most amazing thing too. You've got someone who sleeps under a desk, who doesn't take vacation, right? Who works maniacally to get these things done. And all people do is kick him. Why? Yeah. Oh my gosh. They're jealous. Yeah. I'm like, They're please just give him, give him all the resources, give him and Jeff all the resources they need. And they will literally have, they will have us up in space working and doing these amazing things. And then more people will come in. Um, the young people today will get up there and they'll be, they'll be we're already cu curing diseases on the space station. Oh my gosh. That's how we've been like 23 years up operation and more. Yes. Amazing things happening. And yet we're at this age, we're in this middle of this digital, this digital renaissance, the second renaissance of humanity. And, and yet like the first renaissance, it's a time of great economic upheaval, political upheaval, plagues, famines, wars. But the famines today are politically created mm -hmm. by Putin. Artificial mm -hmm. creation of a famine. Mm -hmm. We've got the first society in human history that can feed itself, educate itself, clothe itself, and medicate itself. Yeah. And there's certain leaders out there that just can't get it through their heads. Yeah, you know, they have to tear things down. And it's like, stop. Look at space. Build it. Go. Get it done. You know, I, I want to leave a better world for our children and grandchildren. And we have the ability to do it. We just have to get out of this bloody mindset of scarcity.
So I've had way too much coffee, and it wasn't. Well, you're doing it, and we love yeah. you for doing it, and and uh, sharing it there. Uh, Change Marty, space. Uh, Marty, we've learned so website. much stuff uh, from you, and I've got notes here, of some books I'm going to read because I was going to go. Oh yeah. Off air, I was going to say to you, you know, I need to bone up on this a little more. Now you gave us the information, all of us out there, to read up on it there. Oh, everything I've told you today, you can Google. We so will check all this stuff out. It's amazing, oh, uh, and it yeah. is amazing. And it's a, you're an amazing person no, to. Uh, lucky to be here. Well, you know, not just just that you have the ability to bring things together like this, and 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 I think uh, 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 keep keep doing it. Keep well, doing. Thanks it. to the team at Lone Star. Yeah. Because let's see, all I do is make the coffee. They do everything. No, you okay. No, no, they're incredible. I'm very fortunate to be working. No, with uh, well, you got to have a good team, and the team's got to like each other, mm -hmm. and. Uh, 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 when I look at management, is you uh, you put the li the people that like each other together right away, and you keep the people that don't like each other apart, and then you figure out where. Oh, I know. I, I throw them. No, I I want uh, discussion and diversity. Uh, I want the most. Well, then then, then yeah. you figure out where the apart people want to get 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 on <laughs> yeah. the, the board there. But yeah, no, the, you're you're right. You need all kinds of opinions there, and you no, certainly absolutely. are awesome. Well, I was always. I mean, Jay told me if you walk in the room and everyone's saying yes to you, you've done something wrong. He also said, if you walk in the room and you're the most intelligent person in that room, you have fundamentally failed. Really? Yeah. He said, you need to surround yourself with yeah. people who are far more intelligent, far right. more capable. Delegate. Give them the goal. Make sure they have the resources and step the heck away and let them do what they're going to do. Great management advice out there, everybody. Yeah. Whether you're running a small business uh, uh, with the family or a multi-million dollar business, uh, mm -hmm. it's all about people and, mm -hmm. and, and not uh, about the skills they do. It's always not uh, who you know, but uh, what you know. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Well, what you know Sometimes, about who you know. But what yeah. you know about who you know is right. <laughs> but come out to the museum, please. Come to the museum. Come see a launch. Two Absolutely. launches a week this year, three launches a week next year. Yeah. Oh my goodness! This is where history. This is what history is. Uh, it's we're at the bow front of quantum and temporal possibilities right now. So many things like that. That Starship launch this morning. A Star a Falcon Nine launch last night. Another one coming from the West Coast this today, I think. Yeah. And everything is changing so fast. This is an incredible moment in human history. It, it, it really faster. is. There's so many. Kind, we can't keep track of them. I can't keep track of them. It's a full time thing for people to keep mm -hmm. track. The landscape here, but come here and see it. But we're gonna be, we're yeah. gonna keep track of what Chris Stott's doing with his Lone Star Company up there. We learned so much today. So grateful that you and your wife uh, Nicole Stott have embraced our little humble museum here. Wanted to go out on kind of a fun note here. I was telling Chris that I, we he has seen thousands and thousands of pictures of his wife as an astronaut and presentations and so forth, but. Uh, uh, Chris, this is my, if I was you, this would probably be one of my favorite pictures of my wife right there. That's, what do you think a, about that there? Well, that was, that there was, she that is was, on the was, far was, left uh, with uh, actress uh, uh, Tara Henson and Bussy Phillips is on the right there, sitcom actress. Uh, tell us, I mean, very complimentary, your wife there, huh? There's no, it's, cool that's very nice. there. It's, it's very nice. That was Olay. That was... Uh, she did a Super Bowl ad. That's that the Super cool. Bowl ad, indeed. Yeah, very cool. Uh, they she did a it Girls Who Code, a uh, $500,000 yeah. pledge Olay donated. I love it. Uh, to uh, Girls Who Co Code uh, on STEAM uh, science activities there. Well, so. think about that. In a software-defined future, a data-defined world, a computer doesn't care whether you're a boy or a girl. Okay. So you can get into coding and you can change the course of human history. It's amazing. Computers are amazing things. I've and, been coding since I was a kid. And uh, there, I had to fight my parents to try and get some of the early computers and stuff. But it's it's an incredible tool. It's like fire, data, and fire, the two greatest tools we've ever had. Awesome. Good, great way to put it there. Thank you, Chris. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank no, you very much. Well, well we you. want you to come back, of course, when you come in here. And I become a little more intelligent about all this stuff. No, it's no right. I think all of us have learned a lot and you know uh, space commerce is what's happening uh tell your you know the careers are out there for young people to embrace uh, mm -hmm. uh different uh space laws and institutions oh are going to be gosh, popping yeah. up all over oh and you're on the yeah. forefront of that and they, that's it every, every job you could ever imagine is in the space program that's right every, absolutely from every, janitor to yeah. computer coding to to map makers or whatever so i love that what about jfk Yes. When he was going up to one of the NASA centers, I think it's NASA Langley, and there's a gentleman there who was cleaning the floors when he came in. And 
very much a politician, so what do you do, sir? And the, gen the gentleman turned around and said, I'm putting a man on the moon, sir. Mr. President. That's and cool. I love that about the space program. I do too. We, it's, we uh, Stanley that. Kubrick said it was he, the, the first time he'd ever met people in the world who collectively had a sense of purpose and a sense of mission and a sense of vision. And think about that. Every day, the people in the space program, space companies, satellite communications, remote sensing, everything we're doing, yeah, go through, go to hell and back on the technology and the bureaucracy and the struggle to get it done. And I always call it the Moses syndrome, right? These are, these are people who are giving their lives and they know they will never see the promised land themselves because they're building that promised land for everyone else, that better future. Mm. And every time I see a launch, it's like running to heaven on a pillar of fire, greater than the sum of all what we do. And somehow we pull that off. It is incredible. It is incredible. Amazing. And you have a poetic way of putting it together. And again, we thank you for your spending your time here on Stay Curious. And uh, we're going to be promoting uh, the things you're doing and putting data on the moon. You better believe it. So, Marty, thank you, thank you for a great Streamlabs job today. All right. We've had a wonderful week of everybody uh, enjoying our museum with uh, Jack Lausma and mm -hmm. Rusty Schweiker here. Nicole great. Stott here this yeah. week. Uh, just doesn't end, and you know where to find what's going on here at the American Space Museum. So, once again, thank you to Chris for enlightening us. And I'm Mark Marquette as we go out here, Marty. And I have a way of going out as I say, we can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us. Cheers. <laughs>